and good afternoon to all. Thank you for zooming in today. I hope you enjoy the launch and our presentation of the Roberts Translational Imaging Facility. Uh, the facility is equipped with the high magnetic field 9.4 MRI scanner, and it is also a PET scanner. So uh, I just borrow a couple of minutes uh, to introduce our facility. So uh, this facility is a joint venture uh, between SNRI, uh, Stark Neuroscience Research Institute led by Dr. Lam, and also radiology and imaging science uh, led by Dr. Hutchings. And uh, currently we have uh, the following uh, personnel, scientific director myself, uh, uh, business manager Jason Shai, facility manager uh, Sam Faust, and uh, high field MRI physics, Dr. Nia Wang, and also uh, engineer Dustin Doughty. And this facility, we have uh, the uh, hardware 9.4G, as I mentioned earlier, as also a simultaneous PET imaging uh, insert with the PET imaging capability. Uh, with, it is a 300 millimeter diameter, so it's uh, very suitable for small animal imaging. And uh, we do have uh, uh, really nice gradient strength uh, capable with the high resolution imaging. Other than the hardware, we do have software to process the uh, volumetric data and the PET processing. Uh, the last one is the coil. So uh, to accommodate different uh, size of uh, the animal or specimen, we have uh, all kinds of coil. And uh, the most uh, fancy one is the, this coil pro which can enhance the signal to noise ratio by uh, two to five fold. Uh, we also excited we have a coming uh, high uh, performance uh, gradient coil with 2000 uh, mini tesla per meter, maximum strength for uh, really high resolution ex vivo imaging. Uh, the current capability, I believe uh, Dr. Uh, Tal Sasser will introduce more about this. This is just uh, a list of what we are uh, doing currently. Uh, standard, the anatomical imaging for volumetric measurement, also other advanced imaging, functional, perfusion, diffusion, and molecular. For the PET part, uh, currently we can do uh, EG tracer, uh, also tracer for amyloid beta, tau tracer, and uh, PTSM for perfusion and dopamine system. And uh, uh, this last just uh, uh, a brief introduce how to um, initiate an imaging study. So first uh, uh, decide on what kind of imaging study or MRI sequence you are interested in. Uh, and uh, reach out to us anytime if you wish to learn more about our capability and we will arrange a startup meeting. Uh, once we have, uh, after the startup meeting, we can sort of go from there. But uh, uh, usually the first thing is to uh, acquire the regulatory approvals such as IACUC and the radiation safety approval. Then will be a registered study, which is pretty straightforward. Once the study is registered and we can work with you to schedule imaging, and uh, um, the scheduling is also a very uh, straightforward process. Just uh, send your email and uh, your uh, potential time and uh, we can work from there. Okay, uh, that's that. Uh, I'll stop sharing. And uh, um, let me stop and stop sharing. Okay, uh, let me introduce Todd. So uh, Dr. Todd, uh, actually his presentation is the highlight of today's seminar. So we thank him uh, to come here. And uh, 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 Dr. Todd Sensor, he is currently the head of PCI application from the scanner company, the Brooker Biospin. Um, and uh, he's going to introduce the advanced imaging capability of this scanner from uh, the uh, broker perspective. 
Dr. Sasser, he received his PhD in biomedical science from University of Hawaii, Honolulu. I'm not sure it's the best place to concentrate and think about science, but I'm sure you have a good time there. So before PhD, he received a master degree uh, at University of Liverpool, England. And currently, uh, Dr. Sasser, uh, he specialized in optical and nuclear molecular imaging for over a decade now. He has worked with research institutes across the world, including us. He has a long-term history with the Indiana Institute. Previously, he was a visiting scholar at the University of Notre Dame for six years, working with their imaging group. And he currently serves as the head of the uh, Booker Preclinical MRCT Path application team in the Americas. So, uh, uh, Todd, why don't you take over? Sure. Thanks very much, Dr. Wu. It's my pleasure to in the group today and to discuss a little bit about uh, positron emission tomography or PET imaging. Um, my background, as Dr. Wu mentioned, is in molecular imaging, so optical and nuclear molecular imaging. But today we're going to talk a little bit about a PET MR. So some of the basics of MR, um, the details of which we have dedicated application scientists and as well as obviously the specialists um, in the facility as well uh, to go into fine details of that. But really we're going to talk about some of the synergies of combining an anatomical modality like MR with a molecular modality like PET. And so the image here is actually an image that was acquired at the beginning of last year um, at the facility showing a high resolution brain image combined with a molecular PET image. So we have the capability to have high resolution anatomical and then combine that in this case with a functional tracer, very common tracer, FDG PET, which shows us where metabolic activity is happening in the brain of this mouse. And then finally, um, one of the key adva advantages of PET imaging is the highly quantitative nature of PET. And so we're showing one of the tools that's included in the system, which is a volume of interest um, template map for a mouse brain. And so you have all of the functionality, all of the scan capabilities, uh, to acquire both MR, PET, and then perform high-end analysis. So people that maybe are familiar with Bruker, Bruker is um, a diverse company. The division that I belong to is the Preclinical Imaging Group, and we have a very, very long track record in MRI imaging. So we're market dominant. You know, conservative effort, conservative est estimate would be that we have 90% of the market. So almost every uh, institution in America has a Bruker MRI uh, scanner system that looks something like this. There's different variations of this. Um, but over the last decade, we've invested heavily in expanding our portfolio to be multimodality. So we've invested in micro CT. We've also invested in pet development. And in the last six years, we've implemented a complete integration of these different modalities. And so what you're gonna see is that the PET insert product that was released in 2016 and is shown in the bottom right corner next to an MRI scanner um, is able to fit inside of your MR scanner. And in this way, you can acquire a MR image and a PET image at exactly the same time. So it's a very time saving process. Um, we've also invested in PMOD, which is a PET analysis software package, which really takes advantage of the quantitative nature of PET. So Dr. Wu already mentioned some of these points in terms of the configuration. This is the actual magnet at the imaging facility. So it's a 9430 magnet, has very powerful gradients, a lot of accessories, has a cryoprobe, and the PET insert. And so just to point out, this is really kind of a special configuration. It's really one of only two 9.4 Tesla systems in the world that also has a PET insert. So a lot of the PET insert configurations out there on the market, which are out in, installed out in the field, 
um, are lower field systems. So they're not equipped with all of the high-end features that the system has to offer. If you see something in a research publication, so what does this mean? If you see something in a research publication that involves MRI, involves PET MRI, the chances are very, very good that this system is going to be able to reproduce that. So even if you look at a research article and it says, well, it was made with this or that scanner or this or that configuration, this scanner is really configured at the very current uh, edge of the technology. So you're very, very good chance that you're going to be able to reproduce something um, that you would find in the literature. Won't go too much into the differences in the coils, but you have a variety of different coils available and your system is configured with um, some of these that were mentioned, the details of which would really only come into play depending on discussions about your particular anatomy or applications or sensitivity that you're looking for. But on top of that, as was mentioned, you have something that's called a cryo coil or a cryo probe. Um, and this is also a completely unique, um, this is a completely unique piece of hardware. And that unlike a room temperature coil, like the ones that are shown here, it's deeply cooled with a cryogen. And so this allows you to boost your sensitivity. So yeah, you have a 9.4 magnet, but when you combine it with a cryo coil, it's probably the equivalent of somewhere like a 12 Tesla signal to noise ratio or sensitivity. So it's really at the very edge of, of what can be done. So I, I, I wouldn't underestimate what could be done with the system with the particular configuration that you have. An important aspect of doing MR imaging, in addition to having your own internal experts, is a catalog of predefined application um, methods. And so what we're just showing here is um, essentially the software is pre-configured by the species, mouse or rat, then maybe I said I'm doing head, and then I select uh, also that I'm doing uh, a particular type of scan. In this case, it's just gonna be anatomy, but it could be diffusion imaging, it could be relaxometry, it could be uh, spectroscopy. All of these are included and you have at your site a completely comprehensive software package. Um, the methods can be fine tuned a little bit depending on your, your particular model, but you have all of the expertise at your facility and we're always happy to assist here. But this is really just showing the kind of exquisite resolution that you can achieve with the combination of a high field magnet and the cryo coil. So you can see um, even within the tissue, the ability to just really see a, a really fine level of detail in a very reasonable amount of time. So the cryo coil can be traded off in terms of uh, getting more resolution, but also I can use it to do a shorter scan. So it really buys you uh, quite a lot in terms of capabilities. Um, the protocol library, just showing that uh, another anatomical, if I were to go in and select um, anatomy, and now I wanna look at the abdomen of my animal, um, all of the protocols have been pre-optimized for that particular anatomy. So things that, that as a non-MR expert, I wouldn't even know how to begin to optimize our MR application scientists have come in and said, well, okay, this tissue has more fat, this tissue has different types of properties. And a lot of the high level details are already optimized. The other thing that it's showing here is that you have motion in the abdomen and the system is already pre-configured. If I'm imaging the abdomen, we're already gonna get a motion um, a way of, of uh, eliminating artifacts caused that by that kind of emotion. You also have newer methods that are recently released um, in the current version of the software. So as part of a collaboration with IUPUI, we've done some um, testing on some of the new developments in the software and recently upgraded the software to the latest releases. And so things like fat water separation, so doing chemical shift imaging. So if you're looking at or interested in doing any kind of a uh, profile for tissue differences, um, 
there's a protocol that's predefined, you acquire it, and automatically when you execute the acquisition, you get a image that provide you get two separate images. You'll get the water content, you'll get the fat content. And in this way, you can do a volumetric or semi-quantitative um, evaluation of, of tissue composition. Another very common um, area for high field MRI, and again, a, a, an area where you're really going to benefit from both the cryocoil and the high field imaging is spectroscopy. So users commonly looking at different metabolites in the brain, for example, um, will use spectroscopy. There's three primary methods um, in, in the MR Paravision software suite that uh, your, your imaging core can direct you to use, depending on what your objective is. But the real advantage of this higher field is that I, there are a large number of metabolites. And if I'm working with the lower field, the three Tesla or other, I am not able to resolve different peaks. So with a higher field system with a cryocoil, I can really pull this out and see a lot more metabolites, a lot more um, molecules in my tissue than I would other be, otherwise be able to do. And people use it for a lot of different um, applications. Um, so a lot of neuroimaging applications, of course, looking at uh, GABA, glutamate, neurotransmitters, phosphate type of uh, metabolic activity. Uh, people look in the muscle and the heart as well, but this is just showing a kind of a simple example of looking at the effect of exercise on an animal and the glutamate activity levels uh, with and without exercise. So this is one type of activity. Uh, another common, rather complex um, application is functional MRI. And so this is essentially looking at real-time changes in uh, neurological response, commonly to some kind of a stimuli. Um, and what's being detected are changes in blood oxygenated levels throughout the brain. Um, and in this case, it's an example of a neuroinflammatory animal, but this, this type of a, uh, a scan and analysis is done for a lot of different reasons in a lot of different animal models. It is rather at the far end of the complex sort of uh, scan setup though. Um, angiography. So there are different types of angiography methods. And what this allows you to do is really visualize, and depending on what your purpose is, maybe I want to actually see or measure a flow rate, I might use a different type of angiography method, or maybe I want to see um, really isotropic or the, the vasculature in a range of different directions, I might use a different method. And that, so that's what we're seeing here. And you can imagine there's a wide range of reasons that we would look at um, the uh, angiography of the brain, but other tissues, maybe I'm looking at uh, tumor development and I wanna look at uh, the, the angiogenesis or the process of angiogenesis, or maybe a therapeutic is angiogenesis disrupted around a tumor, uh, particularly if I have a therapeutic and I think that's the mechanism of action. So there's a lot of things that I can do and I can do all of this in vivo following a single animal or a cohort of animals over time. Um, cardiac applications, um, and then just to move forward a little bit, um, this is showing um, what we would call a sign image. And so we're seeing all the phases of the heart. The software has a unique feature in that traditionally, this type of a, an image would require uh, monitoring, ECG monitoring of the animal throughout the scan. But some of the, the software has some tricks that it actually can look at the image in a preview mode and obtain without any of those SAI, without any of those um, ECG leads, um, the motion of the heart and be able to create an image like this. And so you can see how this can be used. The nice thing about this approach as opposed to an ECG, uh, an ECG type of a detection is that if you have an abnormal heart or diseased heart, sometimes that ECG signal is not so normal. And if I'm relying on that signal in order to be able to create the image, um, it can influence the quality of my data. Whereas if I have an image-derived uh, gating uh, capability, 
I can have very diseased animals. They can have very irregular types of uh, ECG signals, and I'm still able to reconstruct that kind of data and achieve very high resolution and a lot of detail. I'm going to skip past this just for the sake of time. This is something called fiber tracking. You can do this in different tissues. So now a little bit more about the PET insert uh, and simultaneous PET MR. So all of these nice MR capabilities by itself. So why do I even bother? Why am I even doing PET imaging? Well, the key reason here uh, is related to the sensitivity of the detection. So PET imaging is orders of orders of magnitude, higher sensitivity than MRI and micro CT. Um, it also allows you to more easily, more routinely uh, make molecular detection. So the distinction between MRI and PET is really not only much higher sensitivity, but it's also achieving molecular detections. Now you can use MRI uh, to do some kinds of molecular imaging, um, but it takes more tricks and still the sensitivity is typically not on the same order. But combining PET with MR um, gives us a lot of benefits. So a, a historic uh, evolution of PET imaging um, was first PET by itself. And the issue that clinicians and preclinical research found is that I don't really have any landmarks um, for my PET signal. Um, so over time, both clinically and preclinically, systems began to integrate PET with CT. And this is okay, except that CT has certainly very limited soft tissue contrast. Um, and definitely without a injection of a contrast agent, pretty much what you see with CT is skeletal structure, lungs, um, but soft tissue details, we're not gonna see those. Um, and then over the last uh, decade, with developments of the PET technology, um, PET and MR have been integrated. And this gives you not only a much better soft tissue contrast reference, but allows you to do some types of more complicated studies that really aren't possible by PET CT, PET by itself, or MR by itself. So with PET MR, we can do things like inject a PET tracer and inject an MR tracer at the same time. And in doing this, we can interrogate multiple things at the same time and actually and better inform us about the individual detections. We can also use MR-derived corrections. And I'll show some examples of that, but like we showed the cardiac respir or the cardiac um, motion, we can use that same signal that we get from the MR and now apply it to our PET image and get all those same benefits that we would never be able to get from PET by itself. And then finally, what we would call multi-parametric imaging. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna go into this, except that I think if you're a PET physicist, you'll probably be interested in this, but why didn't we always do PET MR from the very beginning if it's so great? Well, it, it's quite complicated and it took quite a long time for um, engineers and PET physicists and not, not my area of research, but essentially to develop detectors, PET detectors that could sit inside an MR field and wouldn't be completely disrupted um, and vice versa. This is a publication from last year that's really nice. It's the first preclinical pre um, evaluation of a PET MR system to show, look, we can both run the MR scanner and the PET scanner at the same time, and we don't get any decrease in the integrity of the PET, and we don't get any decrease in integrity of the MR. So it shows both ways that doing this isn't going to cost in terms of the quality. Again, for anyone that's, that is interested in um, nuclear imaging, these are the performance specifications. You'll find these detailed in that publication. And I'm happy to provide a reference to anyone that's interested. And so we showed you already the drag and drop MR protocol library. We have the same uh, drag and drop methods for PET as well. So we just queue those up, we drag and drop, we say this is the anatomy, this is the PET scan, everything's pre-optimized. Um, you drag those in, 
and it runs through the queue. If you have a MR scan running and a PET scan running, um, everything's automated and registration is automatic. So we're showing right here a display in the software of uh, an example of a whole body mouse uh, scan by PetMR. And then just to show, as I'd mentioned, we have integrated and also at your system um, PMOD analysis software. So we're just showing we can easily take our data with two clicks, kick it out on the same workstation and automatically open this up. And we're available to do these kinds of uh, complex pet analysis, like applying a brain bio atlas, doing advanced kinetic analysis. So doing things like I can actually calculate what percent of my receptors, my neuroreceptors in my sample are occupied by a particular neuro uh, transmitter. I can look at a tumor cell and determine what kind of a uh, what kind of receptors are being expressed. And this might tell me things like, is this tumor cell line going to be susceptible to a particular drug type, or is it going to be resistant to a particular drug type? And helps to drive um, both in the clinic and then in development, um, how those therapies are carried out. So we'll look at a few applications from a few different sites. Um, and again, so this was uh, a nice early example um, from the group, I think from the beginning of last year, just showing, you know, multi-slice um, MRI and PET, and there were more slices in this, but just so that it fits nicely into a slide, we're just showing here, um, four slices in what we would call the coronal um, field throughout the brain. And one of the interesting things here that I think this highlights about the soft tissue contrast and um, just sort of an incidental finding is that this mouse is a mouse we believed it was a normal mouse, but actually if you look at um, the, the ventricles of the brain, there's actually something not right here. So at the top center, this is not a normal structure of a mouse brain to have this um, ventricle spot at the top, which is just something incidental. We wouldn't have known that if we didn't have the soft tissue contrast um, of the MR. But things like, uh, this is from a, a group out of uh, Belgium, um, early stage glioblastoma. So uh, if I was relying on PET-CT, um, it'd be very difficult for me to visualize the margins of a of a brain tumor like I'm able to do here. But actually in this case, they're able to use the soft tissue margins to draw a volume of interest. And then I can apply that to the PET image. So I can actually start to get quantitative molecular data potentially much sooner than I would have been able to with PET-CT simply because I have the benefit of that soft tissue margin. Another new feature, um, as I mentioned, we had tested some features of the software with IUPUI are some new advanced reconstruction algorithms. And PET is very sensitive, but yeah, we also want to be able to expand the contrast and the de early detection as much of, as possible. So what's being shown here um, is a early stage Alzheimer's mouse. So at a very early stage, imaging was completed with Amivid PET. So a, a PET tracer, a clinically approved PET tracer that has specificity for beta amyloid plaques. Well, you'll see, gets back to the beginning here, with sort of a standard reconstruction, does not great contrast, but you see that sharpness comes into play. That's where we apply some new algorithms that are specifically designed for that type of scenario where I've got very low contrast, so maybe I've injected a very low amount of tracer, or maybe it really is, like in this case, just a very low density receptor, I can still be able to contrast those types of features. And we might say, okay, well, is it real? And actually, if you slowly increase the transparency, we see, yeah, that makes sense, actually, where those, where those contrast regions are localizing to. They're localizing to regions of the brain where we would expect amyloid plaques to potentially be present. Um, again, another uh, example of where the soft tissue contrast is really going to allow you to do things that just you wouldn't be able to do without this combination. So uh, a 
a subcutaneous xenograft tumor. And what you're seeing here is, is the PET signal overlaid on an anatomical MR. And what we see here is what we would call the tumor microenvironment. So we see a lot of heterogeneity in the soft tissue that we really probably wouldn't appreciate without that MR soft tissue contrast. And the interesting thing here is, well, you can say, oh yeah, and actually that MR tumor heterogeneity aligns really well with my molecular signal. So it, it's almost lock and key in some of the structures. So the question is what's happening in the tumor? What would be causing? And, and this is an active area of research, just tumor heterogeneity. Why are some parts of the tumor dying? Why are some parts of the tumor thriving? Um, and this allows you to look at things like that. I mentioned before um, the possibility to image multiple contrast agents. So this is an example of a group that is tracking stem cells. So they've labeled stem cells with a PET agent and with an MR agent, and they've tracked them over time. And what this can allow you to do is detect, in this case, this, this approach can allow you to do different things, but while the MR, while the contrast is sufficient in the MR, you can potentially see in very high resolution where the stem cells are localizing to because the MR fundamentally has higher resolution. With the PET, we can now track very sensitive, in a very sensitive way to a range of tissues. Um, so we might be able to detect um, some of the distribution that we can't detect by MR alone. And so this is just uh, one example of where we're doing that. This is an example, exactly as I'd mentioned before, we can take an MR gate or what we call intragate or self-gating. We take the same signal that we get from the MR, and now I apply it to the PET image and I get gated imaging from my PET data, all without doing any kind of an ECG lead setup. So we get all the same benefits. If you have um, an unstable signal, an abnormal heart rhythm, um, this capability really allows us to still get good data. This is uh, another example of, of dual contrast or dual contrast imaging. This is from Michigan State University. They have a 7T PET insert, also in tumor imaging. Um, and in this case, what they've done is they've co-injected um, FDG and gadolinium, an MR contrast agent. And so on the right-hand side, that's what you're seeing is that they've positioned the animal in a scanner. And as they've, the second they've started the scanner, they've, with a catheter in place, synchronized an injection. And so they've made a scan over time. So these types of quantitative scans where I can see, um, where I can see tracer or contrast agent flow into tissue can allow me to get more quantitative data than, than, than simply looking at a static scan. The other thing that in particular with a tumor that this type of combined contrast can give me is perfusion imaging with the MR is telling me, well, this part of the tumor, it's quite leaky. And that can say something about the, the tumor. Tumor can be quite leaky depending on different things, whether there's necrosis, whether you've had a radiation therapy. Um, FDG is showing me where there's probably active cell division, where there's active, uh, a high rate of glucose metabolism. Well, in fact, the fact is the FDG can be skewed in some instances where you have high perfusion. And so being able to look at both, not only can I see different aspects of the tumor um, molecular interplay, but I can also say, well, it's possible that part of the reason my tumor has an increase in metabolic activity is simply it's leaky. It simply is getting a lot of FDG into the area, and I can start to take those kinds of complex things into analysis. And those types of analysis have already been um, integrated into some clinical work streams in PET-MR. So another example of what we would call multi-parametric. Um, this is another subcutaneous tumor. Um, a, a nice example of looking at different molecular components um, in an addiction model. So this is, a, a rather advanced PET technique in that the FTG is 
typically not administered throughout the scan, the entire scan process, but a relatively newer up and coming technique is called infusion PET. And in infusion PET, what this allows me to do is to see more of a real time um, activity in the brain than I would be able to if I simply made a static injection uptake. In this case, the group is actually administering in the scanner FTG um, PET, and they're also administering cocaine and doing spectroscopy at the same time. So I can actually, in the scanner, look at the change in glucose metab metabolism as well as glutamate and other uh, metabolites by using MR. So really a lot of stuff that you're able to do with PET MR um, that you really can't achieve by itself. Uh, just another example here of multi-parametric. In this case, they're using what's called ADC or diffusion um, imaging. And this can, this could tell you some uh, complementary um, aspects of uh, tumor uh, microenvironment. So this is all very nice. Um, and we have a lot of synergies. MR, I think, is traditionally considered to be kind of the longer of, this, of the preclinical or clinical scan types. There's a little bit more preparation um, than you would have with PET or with CT. But the, the fact is, when you are able to do your scans in parallel, so exactly at the same time, we have a PET scan, we have an MR scan, all running at the same time, we, can, we are far less limited um, or constrained than if I'm doing my scans in parallel. So if I'm doing a PET scan and then a separate CT scan or a PET scan and a separate MR scan, we have to take into account, well, my, my animal PET scan took 20 minutes and my MR scan took 20 minutes. But if I'm doing those at the same time, everything took 20 minutes. And you can see just a nice example as well here, um, something that um, the group um, at the lab had, here has developed is not only ability to do nice um, high throughput single animal scans, but the ability to do multi animal scans. So if you were doing something like uh, tracer development or high throughput screening, what this is allows you to do is position four animals in the scanner at the same time. And then using some optimized protocols, you can get a whole body scan um, for your anatomical reference, the PET scan. And then I could also do some organ focus scans or some higher, um, some different types of specialized scans. So this is really the best of all worlds here where you're able to get all of the throughput, um, all of the sensitivity, all the soft tissue contrast that you'd really be able to do with, and there's really no drawback um, in this kind of a combination. So this is uh, the last slide. Uh, there's a number of different webinars um, available on our webpage, but I would just point uh, to one in particular. Uh, Mass General Hospital has a PET insert. It's a 4.7 PET insert. Um, and last year they gave a nice overview of a lot of the work. They've done quite a few different um, applications. Um, six animal mouse imaging, two animal rat imaging, a lot of neural applications, striatum, um, so like dopamine and uh, neurotransmitter types of applications, but also looking at um, things like uh, uh, infarct and, and the group there in particular focuses on those kinds of, of applications. So looking at infarcts in the brain, looking at infarcts in the heart, um, so just to give you, if you're interested in seeing some more examples of, of what can be done, um, I, I'd recommend checking that out. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or anyone can contact me. Um, Thank you, Todd. That's really nice. Um, that very nice presentation and also Thank you to give us uh, many different um, capability potential uh, way to use this uh, scanner.
and uh, different uh, flavor of different kinds of research, including neural and the body. Um, uh, everybody, if you have questions, you can either speak up or uh, type into the chat and then I can ask a question for you. Uh, I, I do have a question to you, Todd. So uh, I guess you um, you are the expert of uh, PET uh, and molecular imaging. And uh, we have been also in quite enjoying your support to our site. And uh, I look forward to working together very for many years to come. So Likewise. thank you. Likewise. Yeah. And uh, go back to the pad. Um, we do have the PMAT software. And uh, I wonder, um, I guess, uh, what I want to learn more about the PMAT functionality. So uh, does the PMAT provide um, sort of a, a dynamic kinetic model fitting? with a different, uh, for different kind of tracer. And uh, does it also provide sort of a, a background correction or of target signal correction, those kind of functions? Okay, yeah, good question. Yeah, so you have different modules. The modules that you have, you have uh, Fuse It, which is the Brain Atlas module. You have the Kinetic module, you have the Basic module. So. Mm -hmm. At the most basic level, what would be done most commonly in the clinic is I just say, what's the uptake value? That's yeah. very easy, completely streamlined. I draw a VOI, it gives me a value that says, okay, you injected this activity, what percent of the, of the tracer is in that volume? Mm -hmm. Now the kinetic modeling, yeah, you have a fully um, integrated library of different types of tracers, the most basic and most common application or tracer kinetic model in there would be something like a potluck clock, an FDG potluck clock. And this is gonna tell me a very specific, so if I acquired in a dynamic mode and I'm evaluating my kinetic data, not only can I get an uptake value, but I get a very specific molar rate of glucose metabolism in my particular region. So that tells me something that is very, very specific, very, very relatively I could compare it to other data much easier and it's much more accurate. So it's independent of all types of cal calibrations and all other um, types of variables. You have a lot of other model, you have a lot of other tools there. We do have online tutorials with PMOD and we can also organize Jeff Warnick with our PMOD, uh, my colleague, Bruker expert um, to, to do training with the group on those. But yeah, there's there's a wide range of uh, kinetic modeling capabilities built in. Thank you. Yeah, uh, if if there's a PMA training opportunity, that will be really helpful. Uh, yeah. In our clinical side, we also do a lot of uh, uh, PET imaging as well, although it's on the uh, PET CT system. So yeah. what I understand is PMA, it can also tag clinical human brain data. Is that correct? So it will read it. It's obviously not approved for clinical diagnosis, clinical research. Okay. Yeah, people do that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, it's, no, yeah, it has brain, human brain atlases and human brain. That's all built in. So it's multi-species. I think it has, I think it has mouse and rat, which is mostly what I use, but also humans and primates. Um, pig, um, I think some other species as well. That's great. And um, so I guess this is kind of more of a, um, open question. <laughs> so what is, uh, so we know the, uh, the uh, evolution of the scanner from very beginning when I was a graduate student, that was uh, 40. And then uh, over the time become 70 and now we have 9.4 T. And I believe Brooker also sells 11 T if, uh, if I'm, my memory is correct. So, so what is the next generation of a scanner? Uh, are you, or does Brooker is working on? What is the highest field? So this is a, I think this is a question you'll get different answers to different people. And I think 
you know, there've been some recent discussions and conferences on this topic, like, what do I really get out of this field? Do I really get, you know, we have higher field products um, that will be available, uncertainly. I mean, that, that will happen. Um, I, I think, and he, I would say even from a research perspective, it's not so clear, you know, what will that buy me? What will I get out of it? I think that's part of an active area of, of development of what is this, what is this going to buy me? What couldn't I do before? Um, you know, certainly if you go from 4.7 to 7 or 9.4, everyone will say that's a game changer. Like the people in the field, they'll say, I can absolutely do things that I couldn't do before. And what starts to happen now, I don't know. And, it, and it, it's not my area of research, but I have heard this conversation. Um, you know, what is that, what's that going to, you know, maybe nothing, you know, to be honest, but maybe something big, who's to say, you know, it's, it's, I think, I think that's a question, an unanswered question. Yeah, I agree with you. I guess uh, the higher field for some application, it kinds of advantages, but not for all application yeah. or for uh, for all different uh, sequence. Be yeah. Because I mean, uh, the biological system change when the field goes higher. So yeah. uh, T1 decrease and T1 of the tissue decrease and etc. Yeah. So it's probably not necessarily um, universally good for every uh, application. Yeah. I agree with that. Uh, okay, we have a question from audience. So um, from uh, Dr. Yu, uh, she asked, uh, can the MRI cryo probe be combined with PET tracer to measure the blood flow of uh, small vessels in the mouse brain? So the, the crowd probe will not go into the PET system. So that is one limitation. The crowd probe has some specific hard components. So you have to use a room temperature coil in the PET insert. Um, can you look at vasculature at the same time that you're doing PET imaging? Yeah, definitely. And with a 9.4, um, I, I think you'd probably, I don't have an example I can look into what's been done, but yeah, I mean, that vasculature and PET combined definitely can be done with, with your configuration. Yeah, but not with cryoprobe. Not with the cryoprobe, yeah. Uh, I, so uh, Todd, you mentioned uh, there's a, uh, for the abdominal imaging, there's a respiratory gating. Is there a uh, cardiac gating as well? Yeah, so there's two types of gating available. We can either do um, triggered gating. Yeah. So we're monitoring as the animal, for example, in respiration breathes in and out. If you're in the room, you literally hear, um, you know, we want to, we want to capture um, the animal when it's in its plateau phase in respiration. So you'll actually hear and we'll see on the on the respiration monitoring, the scanner will click on and off in phase with the animal's breathing. But if you're doing T1 imaging, you can use the image derived signal. And in that case, you can do cardiac and respiration gating without that ECG. Um, it's basically just getting, it has a navigator running in the background. And so it sees the motion in the MR image itself, and you can gate in that way as well, which makes oh. things easier. But if it's T2, you still need to use leads. So that so uh, that is a sort of a prospective gating. Perspective, um, yeah, and retrospective. Yeah. The image drive is retrospective, and the and the and the animal monitoring is perspective. Yeah. Right, using the navigator sequence in a T1 way too. Yeah. Okay, got you. But that, that only apply to T1, not to other sequence. It's only in T1s, yeah. Cool. yeah. So will, will you guys develop applying for sort of prospective motion correction to other different sequences? So it's it's looked at and it, from a method perspective, T2 image drive gating, not my area of 
of expertise is complicated. But no, they're they're looking at it. They're trying to see if they can get it to work. But T1 is easier and more straightforward. But um, yeah, for for T2, you still have to use the the animal monitoring ECG signal to be able to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Got you. Mm. Any other question from the audience? No? I guess we kind of are at the top of the hour. Uh, Gio, do you have a uh, no, I would just like to thank everyone for attending and just to let everyone know this is the last one for the spring session. We will start again in the fall. So uh, please look for uh, announcements as they come around. And um, that's all I have. Everyone enjoy your nice uh, holiday weekend. <laughs>